I've uh, decided to sort of give kind of a pedagogical introduction to auxiliary field uh, QMC for sort of like roughly the first half. Uh, apologies to experts who could take a little break and then I'll sort of fill in, in my focus is mainly through this uh, introduction to kind of normalize some language and help with the uh, discussions and communications given we have this uh, very diverse audience uh, and less um, results, but I've selected a couple on solids. So I'm going to tell you uh, about, remind you of the many electron problem and then kind of uh, talk about the philosophy behind these auxiliary field um, um, methods um, and then talk about um, the connection, uh, give a brief comment, uh, discussion on connection with other flavors of QMC uh, uh, that you might see uh, throughout this conference. Uh, and then in terms of the recent development, I'm gonna talk about solids, mostly solids, uh, computation of forces and uh, stress for structural optimization with quantum Monte Carlo. And then uh, this is kind of a sidebar uh, because of this ability to compute forces and stresses, how do you use them to uh, to optimize for structure, so because the forces and stresses have uh, stochastic noise. So we have some experimentation with uh, how, how to do this. Um, and then if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about correlated sampling for uh, computing phonon spectra. So uh, quantum materials, uh, the quantum, uh, the many electron problem, um, you know, this is one represented problem that the condensed matter community has struggled with for over 30 years, uh, high TC superconductors. Uh, and these are sort of the materials uh, uh, with different complexity, but you can see they're, they're complicated. And the presence of uh, transition metals in these structures um, conspire to make interesting physics, but the problem is quantum mechanical and complicated. This is an example from, if you wish, chemistry, uh, photosystems too. Uh, uh, it's just a protein that converts water to oxygen. And uh, my friends tell me that, uh, you know, this little piece here can be quote unquote simplified to something like this. Uh, the, the goal is to design analogs, for example, to have it uh, solar energy. Uh, but understanding the sort of structure is, is, uh, is challenging. Uh, for example, experimentally, uh, the X-ray would damage uh, this sort of uh, structure. So the idea is, uh, these things are the engine for uh, quantum revolution. We want to be able to make predictive calculations, ideally. Uh, but the systems typically, these uh, so-called strongly correlated systems, kind of a circular definition, what we mean, but we mean that they're hard to deal with. So there's no small parameters to perturb. Uh, the presence often of transition metal elements here uh, imply strong correlations because electrons are clustered in narrow bands, smaller, uh, more narrow space in D or F orbitals. Uh, the properties are often a very delicate balance, uh, competing orders with small energy differences separating them. So you need to be able to resolve those to make predictive calculations. Uh, and that sort of calculations would be a, a foundation for any sort of a real materials genome effort we need uh, at the basic quantum level. So, so uh, the takeaway from that is, I guess, uh, these systems are complicated, and there's no general method that works sufficiently well for uh, all of them. Uh, but uh, that part, I guess, is not very surprising to you. Uh, but I also hope throughout this to show you that we're not hopelessly uh, uh, far away from doing calculations. So I'll loop back to those systems in a second, but um, in terms of Monte Carlo methods in quantum physics, what are we trying to do? Well, uh, like many other Monte Carlo approaches in uh, various disciplines, we're just trying to compute integrals like this. We want to evaluate this. Uh, this is done in often in exponentially large dimensions. In other words, R, this variable, lives in a very large dimension. Uh, so, for example, you know, uh, if you have fermions, these are fermions that live on a 10 by 10 Go board. There's 50 of them, indistinguishable fermions. Then there's 10 to the 29 configurations. And each R, for example, for the next couple of slides, uh, think of them as a snapshot, one picture of this configuration. And if you want to make this uh, quantum, you know, think of these particles as making your neighbor hops. Uh, that's like a kinetic energy, and they interact through a near neighbor interaction. And I've just made them spinless fermions for, to make things a little easier. Uh, so 
I said this, and typically, of course, we hear this all the time, exponentially large uh, dimensions, and that's what makes quantum problems hard. But this is really not unique to quantum physics, right? Classical physics has the same dimension. Uh, quantum physics, quantum entanglement, and the zero point motion, the kinetic energy, increases the dimension, but not by some drastic amount, and we'll come back to this. So then, what else makes it hard? Well, basically, as we said, we want to uh, evaluate this because it's in very high dimensions. We want to sample this probability density function, and then, of course, you can evaluate this integral uh, as a mean. So what makes this uh, particularly hard in quantum problems is we typically don't know f. Right? So in classical physics, for example, we know this is the Boltzmann distribution, this is the partition function. We know the explicit form. Here, we don't know that. It's a wave function or density matrix. Now, it is explicit, for example, in the usual way of uh, variational Monte Carlo, where you write down wave function ansatz, then f is the square of that wave function. So at least it's written down explicitly. And then you can sort of mimic what you do in classical physics. But in general, this is not known. So we need to produce it via some sort of a path integral or iterative process. Uh, for example, like a power method, and you see uh, more clearly uh, as we uh, go to the next page or so. Uh, in generating this thing, F, we introduce contaminations of negative or even complex contributions. In other words, this wave function, as you try to produce it implicitly, you make, it, it, it sees as being positive. The, the, the total contribution here is positive, but uh, uh, the way we produce this explicitly, we introduce noise. And the noise grows as you try to go to low temperature, which is where interesting what you're targeting because the ground state, or you know low temperature, finite temperature, but still make it long. Then this becomes more severe. So um, now we have advantages, for example, compared to nuclear physics. We know the Hamiltonian well in in, in chemistry or in condensed matter physics. So take this uh, thing, the high TC. Uh, it's believed that the main action is in these copper oxygen, these layered planes. Um, you're going to write a Hamiltonian for these guys, the electrons that live in this plane. Right? And you can write it down very precisely. Uh, the Hamiltonian has one-body terms. For example, that's the kinetic energy of these electrons. And external potential is what they experience from the, uh, the ions or, or nuclei. Um, and then there's an electron-electron interaction, which is essentially just Coulomb repulsion between the electrons. So that's the Hamiltonian. You want to solve this. Uh, I'm going to now introduce some notation so we can work in second quantization. But it's really, uh, for any chosen electron basis, for example, like in chem chemistry, you choose some Gaussians or something, you can think of lining up the basis function in some lattice. And so each site now is uh, a... a uh, represents a basis function for bookkeeping purposes. So the Hamiltonian in this basis then can be reduced to something like this, where these are creation and destruction operators. What do they mean? They just put a, so destruction means you remove an electron from one of these sites, and creation means you put one there. Um, all the one-body terms, the things in blue in this language, can be written as a matrix, Tij, that basically the most general thing you could do for one particle is you move it, you connect it from one side to another. So it's like that. It's a one-body matrix. Now, if you just had this, if you didn't have this term, then this is a matrix. It's a large matrix, but nonetheless, it's a matrix, right? The size of the matrix is the size of the basis you choose. You could diagonalize those. There are smarter ways, as you've just heard, right, to avoid diagonalization, but you could diagonalize it. For our purpose, diagonalization would be a relatively cheap calculation in this context. But the two-body is a four-index tensor. It's like this, right? Two particles scattering. So there are two particles that are here. They scatter. They go off somewhere else. So in general, it's a two. It fully entangles the solution. So that's what makes it hard. So in this context, so that's this four C thing. There are four Cs, and a matrix element that you could write down for any given basis. So density functional theory, which I'll refer to as the standard model for us for. Uh, condensed matter or, or, or materials or chemistry, um, does the following. It takes this complicated term and it treats it in a mean field sort of way. Now, the actual foundation theory is much more um, 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 intricate than that. 
Operationally, this is what it does. It takes that and it takes two of these C's and make a bracket, make an expectation with respect to some solution and then take them out. And then you have two C's left, which is a one body operator like the density. So that, that's a functional that's taken from the electron gas and therefore you've gotten a fully one body Hamiltonian and you can solve it, right? Doing diagonalization, for example. So um, coming back to this, what's, what are the challenges? We said that we uh, have high dimensions, so we want to use Monte Carlo to sample, or for example, tensor network to compress or use DMFT to embed, et cetera, variational Monte Carlo, uh, uh, variational Monte Carlo to uh, produce wave function ansatz. The challenges with any sort of a stochastic ingredient is that um, the fermions have anti-symmetry. What that means is if you swap two of these, the wave function or the density matrix needs to change sign. And so for example, think about some, uh, formulating this problem in Feynman path integral. I mentioned before quantum entanglement just makes, adds a dimension. So what it does is think about this board as now lying horizontal and you just make lots of layers of this board and stop at the top. How long this is, is temperature, inverse temperature. In other words, at zero temperature, this is infinitely long. At finite but low temperature, there's lots of stacks of this configuration. And the same particle is connected to itself until you come back to the same configuration. So that's a finite temperature calculation. But quantum mechanics says in between, you don't have to always connect to yourself. You can make a permutation, three particle permutation. In other words, by the time from here to there, you could permute these three and connect back. So these word lines have wound around themselves and that's allowed. So uh, for example, that's a five particle permutation, that's a three particle permutation and so on. These lines uh, do knots. So at low temperature or long path, the even and odd permutations have opposite sign, but they're almost as likely as each other. So they almost cancel and you must sum over an alternating series to get the partition function or the ground state wave function. And so your signal is essentially you know, zero, vanishingly small in this uh, uh, pile of different configurations. Uh, and, and, and to be more precise, it decays as inverse temperature, in other words, proportional to this uh, uh, path in the exponent. So uh, what does AFQMC do? Uh, AFQMC takes a little bit different philosophy it says uh, the interaction can be decoupled. This, remember this uh, uh, tensor, which has four indices. You could always write this tensor in this form where you decouple it into a square of two uh, indices, two uh, 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 matrices, and then there's an index that connects them. So strictly speaking, there should be a sum over this index, right, to, to recover it. And once you have that, so we're going to use power method. We're going to try to uh, apply e to the minus tau h to produce the ground state. So uh, the troublesome part is this v. So I'm taking e to the tau v, and I can write this in that form. V is now written as a v squared. As I said, there should be a sum over this index. So that's in the exponent, a sum, or if you want a product over this. And the product would mean that this integral, so each of these v, that's identity. If you complete the Gaussian integration, it'll come back. So this is uh, called the hubbard stanovich transformation. But um, the key is that now the V squared, the one body operator V, shows up as V, but coupled to an auxiliary variable, and hence the name auxiliary field. Right? So um, the physicist description of this is that you have a many body propagator and you can write this as a linear combination of independent, this is an independent particle propagator because it has only one V, one blue V, one, an action of one particle. Um, and that's coupled to a field and you have to integrate over the field. The field is distributed, for example, by, uh, as a Gaussian. So of independent particle propagators, that refers to this object here, but in auxiliary fields, in these sigma fields. So this little lattice with the, uh, the uh, problem of this type of scattering, now you can transform this into a picture like this, where there is only particles doing this type of matrix, blue arrows jumping around, but this whole system lives in this purple field. And as I said, sigma is a vector because there's a product in front of this, right? For each uh, uh, coupling, there's a sigma. So sigma is a vector and I've just drawn it as having the same dimension as the basis, but it can be more or less. In any case, 
this lattice now lives in some fluctuating external potential. I say it's fluctuating because you have to integrate over sigma. But for every realization of a sigma, it's one particular field. So think about a non-interacting electron system that lives in some laser field or something. The laser field has a particular configuration. And this transformation tells you if you integrate over the, all the possible laser field realizations, you'll recover the many-body correlation. And that's not terribly surprising, right? I mean, you could think about the interaction as exchanging photons or something, right? You're integrating over photon fields. Uh, but that's sort of the basic foundation. Once you have that, you can formulate this in a Monte Carlo uh, in this way. So I've uh, written now the many-body Hamiltonian as a LDA plus some correction, right? Any two-body uh, correction, you can subtract the one-body part of the LDA exchange correlation functional and have the residual as still red. Now, LDA, we're going to think about it as a projection method like this. I said we're going to diagonalize it. This is almost as clumsy as diagonalization. But for the many-body calculation, this helps us to see how we do the many-body part. So you can realize an LDA. I've just schematically plotted this as uh, the overlap of a determinant, a solution, like an occupied manifold of LDA with some trial wave function and or exact wave function or something. I'm just going to measure its overlap. And you can start with some arbitrary random, just like in DFT, some random determinant. And you can realize this projection, e to the tau h LDA, where because you have the wave function, you can make a density. And once you make the density, you have the Hamiltonian, you multiply this. And Thalos theorem says that for any uh, one body operator, this remains a determinant. The operation I'll show you on the next page is simply a matrix, uh, a matrix product. So you go to the next one, and you keep going. And on this graph, it says you can start in Fox space, and you're going to go to a local minimum, which is the LDA solution. You can start somewhere else. You go to a local minimum. They all come, converge to here, which is LDA. Right? So this is a kind of a somewhat expensive way of realizing LDA calculation. And that's that first part. Once I have this framework, I can realize a many-body calculation because my interaction, this delta v, I can now include it as in that form we wrote down before. Integration over a Gaussian distribution of auxiliary fields and then one-body operator coupled to fields. Well, what do the fields do? I can sample by Monte Carlo these fields and I can start from the same LDA somewhere here and they'll pick up, as I sample these fields, random excursion, excursions away from the LDA trajectory. And if uh, this integration tells me that if I add up, after convergence, all these solutions, I should recover the many-body wave function. And this diagram uh, Brenda showed this morning. So basically, you can start from here, which is that LDA solution, and unleash many, many random walkers and carry out this procedure, and you get a distribution that occupies this Fox space. And that distribution is supposed to represent some ground state uh, wave function. OK, so connection with other uh, QMC flavors. So this is what I just told you. Basically, uh, a walker in AFQMC has the form of an occupied set of orbitals. So this is the size of the basis. That's the number of fermions. Right? It's a matrix. Each column specifies one orbital, and that's a walker. And the random walk, as it evolves, these numbers, which can be complex numbers, are just going to stochastically evolve. You rotate the orbital. The jargon in chemistry is you rotate these, rotate these orbitals. That's a walker. The kernel, how you advance these walkers, is that we wrote down e to the minus, sorry, I changed to delta tau, but small. Uh, imaginary time times Hamiltonian has the form of a probability density function for auxiliary fields. I also changed the notation for fields, I guess. Bx, uh, Bx has this form. It's a one-body uh, propagator, e to the, and this, the key is it has two c's, right? It's a bilinear form. So that kernel propagates this into different uh, positions. So that's uh, if you want AFQMC. Now, diffusion Monte Carlo or Green's function Monte Carlo works with R, which is at the beginning, I should, it's a snapshot of the configuration or the coordinates. So R1, R2, this is n dimensional vector or three n dimensional vector. For three n, for n electrons, you carry this. The kernel, for example, in diffusion Monte Carlo has this form. Uh, it's a Gaussian. In many, uh, so you, you, you diffuse the electrons, and then there is a diagonal term that reflects the interaction between them. So that's how this would evolve. Uh, 
And for CIQMC, for example, works in a closely related space, but configuration, occupancy of whatever orbital you choose, for example, Hartree-Fock orbitals. But it doesn't change the underlying Hartree-Fock orbitals. It changes the occupancy on the Hartree-Fock, both occupied and virtual. Right? It promotes, in other words, moves these ones and zeros around. So this has the size of the basis, and the ones, the number of ones, add up to the number of electrons. And you only have ones and zeros. And the kernel is, for example, A minus H, which is the, if you want, think about the leading order expansion of E to the minus tau H. So that tells the configuration to stay, and this moves it by a singles or doubles excitation, right? is the jacket. So how uh, the function you sample in FQMC, you could think about it as this. So this is one walker, this is that object that has the size of the bases as the number of rows and the number of electrons as the column. And each of these Bs have the size of a n by ns by ns, you multiply it, you multiply it, and then eventually you meet some sort of a trial wave function. For this schematic, I only wrote a single determinant trial wave function. Of course, you could have a complicated, much more elaborate wave function, as you'll probably hear from Sandeep, and that would just be a sum in front. But you could do this, this is a determinant, so it's a number. That's a function you're sampling, right? Uh, the fx at the beginning, I said, we don't know. Well, this gives you an explicit form of fx. But it's summed over all these possible x configurations. So in other words, think about lots of paths in field space, this purple variable, different x's will trace out different paths, and you sum over them. But each path is a number, right? Determinant. So these two, schematically, you could think about it as this. You're living, you're dealing with a vector, now the vector dimension here is the size of the Hilbert space. It's that uh, whatever I said, uh, 10 to the 29 or something. That, this is this, right? You, when you sample, you pick one of them, and this is like a matrix, right? This is the whole matrix. And the matrix, John, for example, was telling you about how you make this more uh, sparse, how you truncate it. But the matrix, you take a column, and you, 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 you sample where you could possibly land this, and you choose one. And then you sample it again, you land another one, and so on. You keep going, right? So you're dealing with a matrix that's in Hilbert space times in Hilbert space, and you, you, you sample it. So that's the way of thinking about these. And of course, in diffusion Monte Carlo, this is actually infinite, right? It's continuous. But the same language. Okay, uh, um, um, let, me, let me hurry up. Uh, so uh, AFQMC has the form, I wanted to comment. So uh, this form is, a, um, is the form of a RBM, right? In other words, the um, auxiliary field is coupled to a one-body operator. The auxiliary field, you're sampling. That's exactly the form of a RBM where you have hidden variables and you, you're integrating over <laughs> hidden variables. So if you don't make a long path, you make like one slice or something, that's a one layer of a neural network, right? So uh, you can formulate a variational ansatz, for example, Sorella has formulated variational AFQMC, uh, and that's, uh, that's another c connection to uh, Reduced Boltzmann machine, it's this sort of A form of the neural network states. So um, I want to, tell you a little bit, give you a feeling for how the sign problem happens and how we control it. So this is um, the picture I showed you before, and everything is nice, and you can get your solution back. And uh, it, on this overlap plane, I could, by excursion, because of the random, I could, for example, have a walker that comes here. What that means is the walker has zero overlap with some, some ground state wave function. Now, if it's zero, it's continuously evolving, so I could also go below it. So in fact, it, you could think about this trajectory as, so this is like water, there's a reflection under, that would be just as good, another family of a, a projection with everybody having a minus sign, that's just as good. So once you go here, you could start your family and go belong to the other side. And that, asymptotically, if you wait long enough, you get a linear combination of these, and that would get you a sign problem. So the degeneracy between plus and minus Related, but why do you uh, why the propagator and then approximate? Why is that what? Right in this way. Yeah. We so you mean why LDA? No, why a product? Why a product? Do they compute? Delta PDA? They don't. That's why di a tau is supposed to be small. So it's small. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. And that's the reason for example. Delta tau, and here you have. Oh, so 
Yes, I, sorry. Yeah, they meant, they both meant small. So beta would be the, the other, the large variable. That's the temperature, inverse temperature. Sorry, yeah, so these, this is approximate. And in practice, of course, we could drive this to zero. So this is degenerate. And in fact, when you have a Coulomb interaction, as we're trying to deal with, you don't just have plus minus. I said this is water. Actually, this is an axis. You could just go along this axis, rotate this picture uh, 360. They're all degenerate states. That's a phase. So like that. So this picture, you can just take these paths, they'll rotate around. And you have to choose a gauge. And it turns out formulating that gauge requires sort of more time than, than I have to talk about. But you choose one of the gauges according to a trial wave function. And you, you need to have a zero. Uh, uh, you need to have an exact exactness uh, uh, limit. In other words, if you have the exact trial wave function, that gauge formulation needs to be correct, needs to be exact. So that's the uh, work here to, that allowed to do the Coulomb interaction. OK, so to summarize, this, uh, the idea of AFQMC is to sample in a more effective space where you work with mean field like solutions, which is kind of, in some sense, more quantum uh, and anti-symmetrized. And this renormalizes the sign problem because the leading order sign problem, the basic exchanges, are removed in, in the Walker. And it's much reduced, uh, the severity of the sign problem in typical systems. So, and then you control this with the gauge constraint that I just mentioned. Recent development includes sort of self-consistent constraint that I'll give you a, a, a quick uh, introduction to. So the branching random walks, I didn't talk about branching, I talked about random walks along these matrices. But, you know, determinants would pick up bigger weights or, or smaller weights, just like in, 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 in FUSI IQMC or, or diffusion Monte Carlo, and you could do population control and make it branching. So, uh, but this makes it possible to implement this constraint. That's another statement that I don't have time to explain, but the usual lattice gauge formalism, formalism of doing this would not make an ergodic realization of the constraint. So, but also it con connects conceptually to DFT it, because it really does look like time-dependent DFT, imaginary time-dependent DFT, and you can just really use most of the DFT machinery to, to, to implement this. Um, and so use standard electronic structure machinery. And um, uh, it has low scaling, and this AFQMC has a different philosophy, for example, from FUSI IQMC uh, or SHCI or DMRG. Uh, we want to control the scaling, right, in order to do solids. Uh, so it's parallel scalable and GPU friendly. Uh, it's straightforward to work with models. I won't talk about models, but um, basically, you know, it's the same. We wrote down a second um, uh, quantized Hamiltonian, right? The models have the same form, just different matrix elements. So it has finite basis set error in real materials, just like chemistry methods. Uh, and this is from this uh, nice paper here. Um, and uh, what it shows is both aspects, that AFQMC is very accurate, but also has finite basis error. So if you focus on these blue lines, and these are three sets of bases, increasingly uh, higher quality basis sets and for three different solids. And you can see that the with the basis, so up to 100%, that's the correlation energy fraction is supposed to be, that's accurate, right? So this is getting more accurate. And there's, if you're sitting where Lin is, you can see a little shaded, well here, you can sh see the shade. So th that's supposed to show, so the shaded, the bottom panel, the bottom <coughs> column tells you if you use as the trial wave function to constrain things, a single determinant, what you get. And then the top of the shade tells you if you use a great wave function that Sandeep and others are doing with uh, select CI, what you get. But you can see that AFQMC, there's very little change. Right? It, it's not, this, this is sort of an indication of what I was telling you before, that it's not very sensitive in terms of the constraint. There's very little change. But it does have a much bigger uh, uh, basis set error because it's solving for CI in this basis. Right? So that's consistent in these solids. And the green column is diffusion Monte Carlo. You can see there's very little basis set dependence. In fact, if there's no fixed node error, there shouldn't be a basis set dependence. Everything should be, uh, 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 different basis set should give you the same answer uh, because it works in this, remember, the infinite column, right, infinite basis. But the gray area, that's the fixed node error, right, when you improve the wave function. So I'll give you, how much time? Uh, you're, you're at 30 minutes. 30, so I have a total of 50, right? Yeah, 20 more. Yeah, good, good. So uh, show you a few uh, benchmarks. I said why we do AFQMC. So the, so far it's sort of a, 
I don't know, formalism introduction, but in practice, uh, I want to at least show you that it works well. And so this is a sequence of calculations. Uh, this is done by James Shi. And this one shows um, bound dissociation uh, energy of 44 3D transition metal diatomics, so just dimers, uh, one transition metal with, uh, um, with uh, a carbon or oxygen or something. And when you break apart the bond, how much energy is involved. Um, we tested 10 DFT functionals. Uh, some of these are shown here. Uh, but we also tested, uh, you've heard this uh, mentioned a couple of times, the gold standard in chemistry, a couple called CCSDT, and then a multi-reference version of CCSDT, that's here. And we, these are, uh, the dissociation energy is well characterized experimentally for this set. So this is a comparison against experiment. On the left shows the mean uh, absolute error, on the right shows the maximum error. And AFQMC systematically gets to chemical accuracy, so with a mean absolute error about one and a half kcal per mole, and a max of three, but with an error bar that's uh, about two or three. Um, the experimental values are well characterized, uh, except for three. We, in this process, we questioned them, and it turns out those experiments were redone, and the calculation was correct. So among the 44, there's 41 that's uh, included in here. The three, we had larger agreement. We pointed out which they were, and those were since redone. And, uh, the agreement is very good. So this is now getting a little more complicated, just uh, um, a ligand dissociation. The same sort of story, except it's uh, switched the other way. Uh, the mean absolute error, so AFQMC is here. And different uh, couple cluster is one, oh, here, one of these. Right? So uh, it's doing, uh, it's delivering chemical accuracy on these uh, systems. I forgot how many, or oh, 34 of these. So uh, uh, the Advance here is that we are doing systematic calculations. Uh, and now this is the next tier. So we've done uh, ionization. I didn't show you dimer. And then this. And now this is this, metallocenes. We are looking at the vertical and adiabatic ionization potentials. Um, and the same sort of story. So all electron calculations with about 100 electrons, 500 basis functions. And the trial wave function has about 300 determinants, which are rather modest. And uh, you hear from Sandeep, uh, one could do much more than this now. But uh, this is the accuracy, the red uh, symbols are the accuracy of uh, AFQMC. You can see, again, we are, uh, we are systematically accurate. And that's the, for the two ionization potentials, we get uh, within chemical accuracy, well, within some looser definition of chemical accuracy, three kcal per mole. OK, so um, computing observables. So what I told you before, uh, written another way, we start from some Slater determinant. We're doing this, right? We're doing path integrals going forward. And if you want to compute the energy, you can insert a Hamiltonian here. And this, is the, this whole thing is the f of x I was telling you about, and you just integrate. And the each of e to the minus tau h is done this way, right? With a, with a uh, bx, that's a one-body operator. So that's our formalism. But if you want to do observables, it gets, you, you cannot compute it here because that side is not the exact function. You have to move it to the middle of the path to do that. So this involves some technical uh, things. You have to kind of go forward in your branching random walk and then come back. We call it back propagation. And basically in a path, you have to go like this, finish your whole path, meet the trial wave function, and then take the trial wave function, propagate it back here to insert an observable. So it's a little awkward, but we work in a non-orthogonal space. So anything like this, exists. You could compute it. So the determinant propagated here meets the determinant propagated there. That's a well-defined quantity. Um, and um, for example, if it's a one-body operator, this is just called the Green's function, equal time Green's function. And then higher order correlations can be computed by Vick's theorem. So this is important because if you are in an orthogonal space, then you have a R here, for example, R prime here then the matrix element only exists if the two R and R prime are connected by something. And you remember, for example, in full CIQMC, they're connected by a single or a double, right? You have to find the right matrix element to get an estimator. Uh, and that's, of course, tricky. So in, formally, this doesn't, in FQMC, it's straightforward to compute uh, correlation functions and observables. But as I mentioned, uh, there's subtly, because we do this back propagation, the accuracy is less than the energy. Uh, so O is non-Hermitian? Sorry? O is non-Hermitian, that operator, since you're in a biorthogonal space? So no, O can be 
you can insert any O that's Hermitian. There's no, but like they, the left and right eigenvectors are. Oh, because it's a stochastic sample of a path. So when you average, that gets restored. So uh, self-consistency, uh, I'll just give you an idea. This is, we've done a lot of these in model calculations, but here's a realization of a self-consistency. I told you that we feed it a trial wave function and we impose this gauge condition. But you could do a little better, right? You could, you have a QMC and you've computed some uh, more accurate density matrix. You could use that to feed back on your constraint. So this is basically an idea to do that. We tested two different flavors of ab initio calculations, where we feed a trial wave function to AFQMC, we compute a density matrix. From the density matrix, we extract natural orbitals, form a trial wave function, and then go back and repeat until the process converges. So this is not terribly impressive, a small system, O plus atom in a decent sized basis, and this is the density. And you can sort of see in the inset that we start here, the loop zero, this density, so the full CI is the red line. And, oh, sorry. I don't know. Okay, that one, you improved, but I'll show you the second flavor, couple, uh, couple this to an effective DFT calculation. So this you recognize is the hybrid functional, B3 functional with these different parameters. What we do is we use this as a trial wave function, we feed it into QMC, we then obtain a density, and then we demand we can change these uh, different coefficients, minimize the density difference between what DFT would predict and what QMC says. And then we repeat this process. And you can see that, so for example, this is the density matrix measure. Uh, so B3 lib gives you this answer, and that's not zero. Zero is the best, right? Absolute, this is absolute distance. And you can see that from QMC, we start here, and as we, with the iterative process, we converge eventually to a smaller non-zero error. And correspondingly, the surrogate um, DFT calculation start from here. We, we perturbed it to be a little, far, uh, little away from uh, B3 lib. It reaches here, but it continues to improve until it converges. But when it converged, the QMC is much better than where we started, and the DFT is also better. Right? So we, we believe this is a better functional, but you know, we, don't, uh, we didn't test this um, uh, systematically. And so this is what the energy does. It's basically exact. Right? This is a very uh, small system. What if the natural orbitals have some degeneracy? Yeah, so this one does not have that problem if we, because it's a DFT, we just iterate it to convergence. The first one, I did, which I didn't finish showing, the natural orbital, if it has some degeneracy, we, we in a version where we did unrestricted, that would be broken, but when it's de, um, uh, degenerate, we just took a random combination. We, sometimes that might cause difficulty in convergence, but. You plot out the DFT energy as well, as it evolved. So the DFT, no, not the energy. This is the density matrix right. prediction, and uh, it, that's, that's where it got to. Right. What about the energy? So I don't quite know what happened to the energy. I think it's quite small change, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll find it. We do have it. So um, uh, let me move to this uh, second part, tell you a few new results. Uh, computational forces and stresses uh, to do structural optimization. So this is kind of a challenging problem. You got a uh, sense this morning, and kind of a holy grail in QMC. Uh, there's different technical challenges. I think you'll hear more about it. But I think it's reasonable to say, so far, uh, success really has come from variational Monte Carlo, maybe with a plus, right? A little beyond variational Monte Carlo to do geometry optimization. Fully projected. DMC or AFQMC uh, geometry optimization has been limited. Uh, recently, we, we have progress with machine learning. I think you're going to hear more about. Uh, so uh, I mentioned to you that in this formalism, it's not very difficult to compute an expectation. But it is not trivial to implement the backpropagation stuff. So we use a plane wave basis with this uh, type of a pseudo multi-projector pseudo-potential developed by Hammond. Uh, but the goal of using the plane wave basis is to get rid of basis errors so that we don't have to deal with full A terms. So uh, we have a high cutoff. So essentially, this has no, it's in the continuum, uh, even though it's a finite plane wave. Uh, so for example, when you want the force, like in this cell, you want to move this atom, you want the force. And that force from Hellman Feynman theorem, you could compute it as an expectation. So basically, we do back propagation to compute this quantity for the force. 
And this is benchmark, a little benchmark showing, so as you move this about, the total energy computed, and these are energy, and you do a fit. And the fit is given by this green line, but the little red symbols are computed forces directly through this implementation, and you can see the banner, right? So we're, we're doing a, it's a sanity check. And this is the stress tensor. It's very easy for me to say, but for Sue, and this is a tremendous, this is a long, a lot of work uh, to derive this and implement it, right? But we do the same thing. So, you know, words, you think about different strains of the uh, cell and you compute the tensor for the strain. And we do the same thing, the energy fit and then the actual computed value, uh, just sanity check. So this is all implemented. Now with this, then we can allow the lattice structure to change and search with the FQMC strength tensor to uh, look at uh, optimized uh, solid. So this is one little example of um, uh, uh, aluminum nitride, and we distort it. So this is the structure. I don't know if this is any better for you to see, but it looks like that, okay? So aluminum and uh, nitrogen, uh, and that's the structure. And we distort it to be like this. The lattice is distorted, and we want QMC to find it. And this is what happens. You, so the A, B eventually are supposed to be equal, so you start from here, and uh, through the search, it comes here. And uh, that C, the vertical the separation, it comes here. And then the angle, which starts out at 90 degrees, it comes down. And if you average the result, and I'll talk more about this optimization, and compare it with experiment, it's very, uh, it works. Right? So, so um, this is a structural optimization, in other words, letting atoms move, um, where we are trying to, so diamond, so uh, in silicon, there is a diamond to beta ting, as you, this is volume, energy, as you press it, this, it goes from the usual phase to a metallic beta tin, so-called beta tin phase, that looks like that. So there's two energy uh, versus volume curves. And we, what we do is we're targeting this minimum, local minimum, here, it's a beta tin structure, and we start with this structure, but distorted to have the same volume, so it looks like that. It's somewhere here, the energy, and we wanted to find the minimum. Uh, so there's 24 degrees of freedom, and you search this. So this is the search when you start, and this is some measure of the distance, soap distance, between the uh, configuration and the optimal, the final configuration that we find. And you can see it undergoes different structures, and eventually it gets there. Now, there's a stage one and a stage two, uh, but finally, it gets here. I will come back to this if I have time. Uh, how we did the search? Yeah. I don't. Okay. <laughs> You've got uh, seven minutes left. All your time. Okay. Well, I basically I can skip the phone on part, so I will have a couple minutes to do this, I guess. So uh, yeah. So this is the energy. The energy starts out here, and you can see the oscillation right there. It's not necessarily a, uh, with the distance. It's not a, a direct monotonic search, but finally it converges to the equilibrium um, energy. So, uh, yeah, so this is uh, the two stage, I showed you two panels, what's that about? Basically, uh, optimization algorithm for stochastic gradients. So we, we, we started out, when we had the forces, we just invoked standard, uh, you know, uh, steepest descent or, 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 or different standard uh, optimization processes. And we found that, you know, they don't really work very well with this. Now, one thing is we have the forces, but we don't want to compute the Hessian, for example. That's very expensive, right? We have stochastic forces, and each one is expensive to compute. So we want to minimize the number of computations of forces to find the structure. And so that's the, that's the uh, idea. So geometry optimization brings this question, so what's the optimal search algorithm in the presence of forces with statistical uncertainty or stress? Same thing, right? First gradient. Uh, we, in the end, fooled around and we came up with this algorithm that's uh, different from sort of, as far as we can see, existing ones, uh, tweaks of existing ones. It has this acronym, basically stands for finite step, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, um, steepest descent, sorry. Um, so uh, that's what this is. Uh, in this process, it's coming down, and I'll show you, yeah, so, so. Uh, yeah, so here's a, so this part, fixed step, steepest descent, goes like this for that problem, uh, the, the distance comes down, and we compared it to several machine learning sort of uh, methods, and you can see that it comes, uh, this is, uh, uh, it converges very well, comparable or, or, or better uh, uh, performance. 
uh, we combine this with the second stage, which turned out to be key, which is uh, you stage the error. For Monte Carlo, in other words, we do a first stage where we target a bigger error bar so that we can compute these forces much faster. So that's one stage. Uh, it goes down. And then we um, start a second stage with the average position. So here's a trick. So the second stage, the error bar would be reduced by a factor of 10, for example. So computation per force, 100 times more expensive. But you can see that the starting position for the second stage is a lot better than any of these positions toward the tail end of the first stage. The reason is this. As we go on, we, we keep going, and then we keep looking back to see, have we converged? So for example, by the time we get here, we look back at this history, we decide within the statistical era, we've converged. In fact, we started converging here. Right? When we go back, we realize they're statistically indistinguishable. Without enough data, we can't tell. But we keep running this until we can tell that this is converged. Then we go back and average all of these positions. And that's the new starting point. So it's much better. And then we tighten the error bar, and we continue. So that's sort of the, uh, the basic idea. And this, if you don't do two stages, this is the convergence. It converges to a comparable quality. This is two stages. And there is a tenfold saving in the computational time after, you know, even for the second stage where we uh, ramp up the error bar, uh, reduce the error bar by a factor of 10. In other words, the computational time by a factor of 100. So as I said, I won't tell you, I won't, I'd be happy to talk to you about correlated sampling that we could compute phonon spectra, but let me skip that. Um, phonon spectra. So uh, what I didn't uh, cover, in addition to phonon spectra, is, uh, for example, finer temperature methods and applications. Uh, there's lots of progress recently, too. Spin orbit coupling, heavy elements, we're worrying about that. Uh, new algorithms for constraint release, uh, different wave function ensembles, and embedding. This is one uh, thing that might be of interest to a lot of people here. For solids, eventually, the way I argued how uh, this formalism connects seamlessly with DFT means that you could embed this in a much bigger DFT calculation and freeze orbitals and then create a Hamiltonian that you could treat by FQMC and then interface the two, right? Because the language looks so, so similar. And of course, I didn't touch on any of the lattice models or applications. But one thing I did want to mention is software development. Uh, Miguel Morales uh, has recently moved to Flatiron. We're developing a publicly available code suite. Uh, hopefully, this will help build and expand the community. And, uh, uh, and we hope there'll be data, a data science uh, position to, to help with this effort. So to summarize, um, hope I've kind of convinced you that AFQMC is a general many-body method for equilibrium properties. It's very versatile, uh, can treat lattice models, ab initial solids, or quantum chemistry. It has the form of entangled imaginary time-dependent DFT calculations. Uh, it's over the past decade demonstrated accuracy and capability over a, a, a large variety of systems, I would say. Uh, many opportunities for conceptual and algorithmic advances, including thinking about the sign problem, embedding uh, better finite size formulation, sampling, Hubbard's trans transformation, acceleration, et cetera, et cetera. So it needs your involvement and your insight. Uh, that's why I, I'm really excited with this, uh, this gathering, right, of this, uh, uh, with all the expertise there. Uh, I told you about geometry optimization and not correlated sampling. Thank you.